Helion uses a pulsed power fusion system. That means that we're relying on not one long reaction where we're trying to keep plasma alive for long enough to boil water to spin in a steam turbine. Instead, we're firing multiple times. We are pulsing multiple times per second or per minute, and we're gaining back some joules from every single one of those reactions. So our machine looks roughly like an hourglass on its side. Maybe you've seen it before. We have plasma donuts, these toroids, these FRCs, they get made in the major diameter. And we're actually using our electromagnets to push those around. We'll push them towards the center. They'll go through a conical section. They'll end in our minor diameter, the compression section. And in there, we'll do all of our fusion. We put our highest field magnets there. We are like actively pushing these atoms together. We are fusing them in that part of the chamber. And we're recovering the energy from that reaction directly. And direct energy conversion is a little bit weird to think about too, but my favorite analogies would be like regenerative braking in a car, that's direct energy conversion. Uh, inductive phone charger, also direct energy conversion. Long story short, you're inductively coupling your plasma to your magnets and you're getting charge back that way. You're getting electricity back that way. You don't need to spin a steam turbine to do that. If I zoom way out from that hourglass on its side, you can think about the capacitor bank. That's where we do all of our energy storage both the energy to start the reaction and to capture it on the back end. That all happens on the same capacitors, in the same capacitor bank. So you have literally hundreds of thousands of components that need to be operating in tandem. They need to be talking to each other. They need to be pulsing together. We're talking like nanosecond timings. We are measuring our optical fibers out to the inch level, which at speed of light terms is very, very short, very, very small. But that's how critical all of our timings are. Magnets need to pulse at the nanosecond scale, but their rise times, the time at which that structural load is applied to your magnets, will happen at the microsecond scale or millisecond scale. Things that are kind of cool are like, you know, the person that is designing a pallet or a capacitor module needs to think about what's happening on the electromagnet scale. You need to know how your plasma will couple to your electromagnet because that'll impact your waveform. That'll impact how much current is going where. Right now I'm standing in front of Trenta, which is our previous prototype. So our most recent prototype, Polaris, I can't show you because we're actively making plasmas in it and fusing them, which is very exciting for us. So to show you what we're looking at here, the things to keep in mind are, one, we have multiple sections of this machine that have currently been pulled apart, mostly for demonstrative purposes. And two, you're seeing the remnants of some very precious cables um, that once ran to each of these magnets. But you'll see the formation section starts with a really large diameter bore. So our major diameter in formation um, is the largest because we want to be able to start by making a very large plasma and trapping as much flux as we can. Acceleration is unique as a section because it's where our vacuum chamber inside actually changes sizes. So we go from our major diameter and our large bore of a vacuum chamber inside formation and by the end of acceleration, we have to be smaller because we want the big plasmas that we've just made to be hotter, to be denser, and also to be accelerating towards each other so that in, in compression, they can actually merge and do fusion and get the energy that is the point of why we're here. The primary thing to notice about compression is that we have this smaller inner bore, but if you look at the section as a whole, it actually has like the biggest outer diameter. And the reason for that is just the energy density of what we have to get into it. So you'll see we have way more cables going into this. We will certainly be looking at transmission um, techniques other than cables in the future. We use them because they're really good at having low inductance and really high energy efficiency so that we're actually making sure that our energy stored in our capacitor bank gets delivered in the form of magnetic fields to our plasma in our vacuum chamber. And so the total assembly has to be clocked in such a way that we can get all of the cables in have the electromagnets not touch each other and still have the thing supported. The Polaris vacuum section and the Trenta vacuum section before it are made out of quartz. As we get bigger and bigger, we keep having to find new manufacturing technologies to be able to make quartz tubes that can go in our chambers. We also have to develop all our own in-house seals. So making a structural seal that also holds plasma, that also holds vacuum, and also can survive the plasma environment makes for like a few very specific technical challenges. When we think about our vacuum chamber and contamination, we think of it not just in terms of like particulate, but literally in terms of atomic number. Because if we get 
ions that are too big in there, we will splatter them on the inside of the machine and they will be able to stick around and poison our plasmas in the future. So how we build and maintain and handle the quartz that goes into our vacuum chamber has to start very early in our development process and has to follow the life of the machine through integration. So when we think about the final position of the machine and how it moves physically, not just from sub-assembly integration, but through integrated test and build and commissioning, we have to think a lot about the clearances in every individual section. The way that we think about the axial length of our machine is that anywhere that we are not able to apply magnetic field is wasted space. So our goal is always to get all of our magnetic field lines as uniform within our machine as possible, kind of like a solenoid, um, which means that we are playing tens of foul games on every sign of it to make sure that the totality of like our structural needs and our vacuum support needs play nice, um, not just for initial build and fit and integration, but also when we fire. So when we fire this machine, we don't have to design for a lot of random vibra vibration loads other than maybe like shipping and maintenance, but we do have to design for a lot of shock loads um, and how those shock loads like propagate through the machine is different based on the anchoring points of each section. Um, but you'll also see movement of the vacuum section itself. For example, the compression tube is not constrained within the compression section. So we have to be able to build compliance and know where we're eating those deflections in the different locations so that we can get to a final product that not only like is possible to build, which is a pretty big deal because if you're wrong about how much clearance you need on a quartz tube, like one, it took you a long time to get that tube, and two, it does not break gracefully. Um, but we also have to make sure that we are getting to a vacuum system that works with the rest of the electromagnetic system. So once we actually assemble all these different pieces of our machine together and we can finally get it operational, we get to puff in gas from our formation section, we get to form our plasmas, we get to accelerate them and compress them in the biggest magnets that we can build in this form factor functionally. And we want that collision to have as much energy associated with it so that we can actually get the fusion output in terms of energy converted back onto our capacitor bank for actual electricity that people can actually use. So this is our magnet test facility here. Uh, we've got our big capacitor bank that is just feeding one magnet. Our goal here is to really find out what is the limit of our hardware. These little boxes represent uh, kind of a rotationally symmetric compression section. Here we've got our fusion plasma. So once that plasma is in there, we are ramping up power on our compression magnets and squeezing those, squeezing this together. As it squeezes, it gets really hot, starts doing fusion. And then we basically are able to recapture that fusion energy onto these compression magnets. So what, what makes it so hard? Well, uh, we got to get to really high magnetic field. Our fusion condition generally goes with magnetic field, we'll call B, to the 3.7 power. So it's proportional to fusion, which is crazy. 3.7 is like a huge exponent. That means if I'm like twice as good at making magnets, then uh, that's like a 13-fold increase in fusion yield. Right now we're targeting uh, fields of about 15 Tesla. So what that means is uh, inside of the magnet, you know, we're running literally millions of amps per magnet. Um, the magnetic field is inducing a pressure on the inner surface of the magnet. So you've got uh, all these essentially kind of like internal pressure acting. That pressure, uh, pressure is uh, P equals B squared over two mu naught. You get that this is like on average pressure of 13,000 PSI. So every square inch, we've got 13,000 pounds. Over some like representative area, call it like five square meters, that force is enormous. That comes to like 100 million pounds of force. Uh, to kind of put that into perspective, that's like 25,000 cars. Uh, that's also like 
it was like 58 Falcon 9 rockets just all at once, just like bam, 58 rockets just in this small area. Uh, due to the skin effect, the current is only flowing on just the surface, just like the first few millimeters of, of material. And what that means is like you're flowing these like millions of amps through a very small area that causes heating. So in that very, very small fraction of a second, we just heat the surface layer of this magnet by over 100 degrees Celsius. That induces uh, quite a bit of like difficult to analyze stress states. And you know, if you look at this huge magnet, the current is only flowing on this layer. For that, you really want to divide this tiny layer into tiny, tiny little elements to analyze that. And so that's, that's a tricky thing to do. In addition, our material properties are changing. So the material properties change with temperature, of course. Um, they also change with strain rate. So this thing's a big impact load. This whole thing is, is stretching and moving and deforming really fast. So our material properties actually get uh, stronger with strain rate, uh, which is really great. And it's something we can take advantage of in our machines. We can say, okay, maybe uh, we're you know, 50 KSI yield strength and now at these high strain rates, we're at 60, 70, 75 KSI. And that's really able to get us quite a bit of extra strength. Each one of these magnets is firing on the, and controlled in the nanosecond level. Change some timings by you know, a few tens of nanoseconds and we see what does that do, what does that do to the plasma. You know, sometimes you know, we'll get radically more effusion with just a few nanoseconds here or there. Other times, you know, if you do things wrong, you end up hitting the wall or you end up even hurting our, our power bank. Unfortunately, I can't show you the magnet directly, but uh, what we've got here is kind of a really big steel frame that is containing that magnet and reacting out some of the forces. And we've got all sorts of instrumentation on there. We've got our cables that are plugged into the magnet that are transferring all this energy from our capacitor bank through the coil in like millisecond scale uh, timings. So we're running um, over 5 million pounds of shock loading of magnetic pressure in this test cell. If, if we have a failure, we want it to happen here and, and not in our big expensive machine. One thing we've gotten really good at over the last few years is using laser metrology to understand exactly how we're placing these components because they affect the forces, they affect the magnetic fields, they affect you know, how, how balanced the system is. So if something is just off center, even by you know, 10 thousandths of an inch, that can impart asymmetric forces on the system. And so our models consider asymmetric forces, but we need to make sure that we're within that amount. We've got some exciting structural upgrades, thermal upgrades, uh, magnetic diagnostics, electrical diagnostics, and uh, accelerometers and strain gauges that we're putting in. So it's fun to see all that come together. We're getting a ton of data off, off of this test setup, and um, that's another one of my team's jobs is to take that data and you know, put it side by side with our simulation and say, okay, where, where are we exceeding loads? Where are we under predicting, over predicting? Um, how can we tune the model to match reality? I really do think it's a good use of engineering time to be trying to tackle climate change. And I really appreciate that Helion is taking a very big swing at a very hard problem that is like very, very important. That's certainly why I'm here. It's like what gets me up every day. Like I like taking big swings at hard problems. Uh, zoomed in a little bit. The challenges that get exciting are the scale of everything is just getting bigger. We're like learning so much more. We're adding a lot of components that are gonna be in parallel now just to make a bigger bank, to make a bigger machine. We know our tech scales really well. And that means that we're gonna like continue to make things bigger and better and stronger because that will just mean more fusion performance at the end of the day. You have to think about things in a different way. You have to consider reliability. You have to think about your efficiency of every single component. That means a lot to me. Other really fun challenges, uh, building the like strongest resistive magnets in the world like is super exciting. I really want to make sure it's clear that like we are making a ton of hardware day in and day out. We have 
dozens of mechanical design engineers. All of them are releasing parts. All of them are building assemblies. All of those assemblies are going onto a fusion generator. They're seeing neutrons. We are like very, very focused on making things and we've made a lot of things and they do really cool stuff.